everybody. Welcome to the SoxProspects.com podcast. We are the web's number one source for information on the Boston Red Sox farm system from top to bottom, from Fenway to Boston College, and all stops in between. Thank well, you for the Pawtucket listen. also. Well, they're not in Pawtucket yet. Well, yeah, but it's going to be in Pawtucket yeah, soon. Fair enough. No, well, it's the intro. Let me do my intro. Anyway, <laughs> thank you all for listening. My name's Chris Hatfield. I'm the executive editor of Sox Prospects and the interrupting... I don't want to call you the interrupting cow because that makes it sound like I'm calling you a cow. I'm just referencing a joke, but do you never heard that joke? No. Knock, knock, not, knock, not knock, a boomer. knock, knock. Come on. No. The point is I say the interrupting cow. And then before you say the interrupting cow, who I yeah, just you go say, boo. My, yeah. yeah, I've heard like my, like, okay. Anyway, cousin, that joke. The one, the guy over there without the sense of humor is our director of scouting. Ian Cundall. <laughs> Yeah, let's not fight this time. <laughs> we didn't fight. We I just had to fight. make so, sure you knew you were wrong. Good, it was good the inner, album. It was the inner lawyer in me coming out. Ah, uh, fair. Good piebald album. Sometimes friends fight. Anyway, um, thank you all for listening. Uh, it is Tuesday, July the 7th, as we record this episode of the pod. And uh, there's summer camp happening in. We've got baseball. We've got things to talk about. There's still a start date. There's still a start date. <laughs> things are things are good ish. How, how are you feeling about the state of affairs? Uh, cautiously optimistic because that's all I can do. There's just so much negativity going on that I just it's not ideal. I know there's going to be. I'm very concerned about the health and safety aspect of it, but I'm just cautiously optimistic that we might get to see some regular season baseball at some point. Amen. Amen. It's episode number one eighty six. Thank you, everybody, for coming on. Um, we got a lot to talk about. We've got uh, we're talking about camp. We're talking about draft signings. We're talking about MLB pipeline rankings. We're talking about there's actual ju- news. We're talking about juice pigs. More on that to come. Unfortunate um, <laughs> summer camp. Yeah, um, but we got new rankings. Is really the big ticket item. We're, we're burying the lead here. We've got new rankings on the site. We're going to talk about. How do we have new rankings? There hasn't been baseball. What happened in the new rankings? Where did the draftees debut? Lots to talk about there. We'll go deep on our new rankings because, frankly, that's the most interesting thing we have to talk about right now. And, of course, we we have emails. We have a couple of emails that we have been putting off because they require kind of detailed answers. So we're going to get to those. Uh, We're going to talk about Red Sox developing pitching, and we're talking about the antitrust exemption because we got an email about that. So we're going to talk about all of those things, maybe more. Who knows what will come up. But uh, listen in, which should be a good episode. As always, we want to give a shout-out to everyone who supports us on Patreon.com slash Sox Prospects. You can support the podcast on Patreon.com by signing up, pledging an amount per episode, getting some perks out of it. And as always, we want to give a special shout-out to our $5 level Patreon supporters. That would be Kyle Costigan, Tyler Woodrow, Jeff Trainer, David Nardone, Tim Harding, Bill Stanton, Deb Kendall, Evan Kirkwood, Hurricanes won, Chris Fox, James O'Hara, Nathan Kenyon, Andrew Walden, Andrew Wallin, David B., Ben Burnett, Al Mendel, Kevin Catrides, Ben and R.I., Paul Denyer, Lendl Martin, Cassandra Bukta, and James P. McMahon. Uh, and of course, as always, send your emails to, to emails to podcast at SoxProspects.com. I, I'm tripping over myself tonight, Ian. This is not good. Not a good start. But anyways, we want to talk about it's what you want to hear. It's for us, too, still. It is. Maybe, I guess. We've we've been doing this the whole time, but we'll. I like that excuse. Let's go with that. <laughs> I'm trying to cover for you. I appreciate that. I appreciate it. Um, but yeah, we, we send us emails. We want to talk about what you want to hear about. Um, one thing that I should point out for folks who want to send us emails, check out the news page where we are running our draft retrospective series, which so far we are through two and a half drafts right. where we are running two entries for each draft. One entry being something that was your idea, Ian, of mm-hmm. we just list all at this point 50, which I completely forgot about, frankly. Yeah. Like I've, I've been editing them and I get to 40. I'm like, all right, good last one. And I'm like, oh my God, there's 10 more. But the yeah. thing is they've actually been great to read. Thank God. So, yeah. um, it's, I mean, it's just cause of the names, like I'm looking at the one today, like remembering like the Red Sox drafted Jason Castor out of high school and he's still playing in the MLB. Kirby Yates, Kirby yeah. Yates. They drafted in 2005. He didn't sign. Was he, and was he, he got, a position player. No, it was Charlie Blackman was a left-handed. Oh, pitcher. that's who I was thinking. I knew yeah. there was a weird one. Yeah. yeah. It's not even like Brendan Belt. Well, I guess Brendan Belt would be another example in the year they drafted yeah. him. But yeah, yeah. Um, yeah, Kirby Yates, they drafted in 2005. He didn't sign, and he got good last year. And they <laughs> they drafted Charlie Blackman that year, too. Yeah. Yeah, it's crazy. I mean, at least Blackman's been good for a while, right? Like, yeah. 
I loved I loved James's line about him that uh, they drafted him as a pitcher and he's led the National League in runs, which doesn't yeah. which isn't good. So it's a good thing they didn't sign him. <laughs> yeah, James Dunn has been killing it. Oh, with, he's uh, been crushing these, it. Yeah, um, he's really. We, he's we, got the we, first four, and then the rest of our staff is going to take over. Sorry, I yeah. stepped over. No, I was just going to say that you know it took a while to kind of like figure out how mm-hmm. we were going to. Um, we we're going to like structure this because we it was something we've been talking about doing for a while, and I'm really happy with how it turned out. Yeah, well, and it's also because like you and James had the same idea at the same time and just different conceptions, right? And so it was just like, oh crap, let's back this up. Which are we going to do? And I'm like, well, why are we picking? Let's do both. So the first day uh, we go through every single pick with just like a few sentences about each guy, and it's pretty great. It's just stroll down memory lane. If you've been following the site for a while, and if you haven't, it's a great kind of primer on the history of the site. But uh, And then day two is a more in-depth look at like three storylines from that year's draft. It might be three guys they picked. It might be, you know, I could see one year being, you know, the fact that they, I've got one draft in mind that I might wind up having to write of, yeah, they were drafting pretty high and they got basically no major leaguers out of this damn draft. So... Yeah, but it's been it's been great so far. Check those out. And the reason I bring it up is because next episode we're going to be recapping probably. Well, we'll see how deep we go. It might just be twenty two. We're starting with two thousand three, so we'll do at least two thousand three and two thousand four next episode. We might do five and six as well, depending on how deep we go. And probably just, I mean, like if we did four of them, I wouldn't want to go longer than like. Well, I think it's, a, on it's each, also so. probably going to depend on what else happens in the baseball. Yeah, world. that's true. If there's things to talk about. Good point. Good point. But yeah, uh, if you've got questions about those, we got a great email today from our friend Matt Corey that I can't wait to talk about because I, it was a similar to a thought that I had while I was reading today's piece. But the problem is, like, we should do that email with the 2005 draft recap. So exactly, you know, if you've got questions about things that came up in these draft retrospective pieces, send them in and we'll talk about it. We'll probably try and get James on too, actually. And, and then in the future, when we have uh, the different writers from the staff taking different years, we might try and get them on to talk about it. So, um, be good practice for our guys in case they wind up doing radio hits in the future. So yeah, uh, take a look at those, send us emails about those or anything else happening, of course, because we want to talk about what you want to hear about. Um, Ian, let's do some quick hit news. Uh, some stuff has happened since the last episode dropped just this past Saturday, actually. So we're going to mm-hmm. hold this one a couple of days from after we record it. But um, first and foremost, today, finally, the Red Sox, were they the last team to sign a first their first rounder? Yeah, no, there were four teams. I don't know if they had multiple first round picks, though, because two of them were in the comp round. So okay. they anyway, might have been the se- last or second to last. I think it was them in Milwaukee, actually. Milwaukee signed, signed theirs their today round. also. Okay, so Nick York finally signed today for... Two point seven million. Yeah, they were the last team to sign a draft pick. I know that. Yeah. Okay. So they were the only team that didn't have one yet. And of course, do you, yeah. do you want to take credit for the fact that the signing happened? Yeah. I mean, I I <laughs> mentioned this morning I was quite was something going on because it was perplexing as to why it hadn't happened. So yeah. So in the Slack, you're like, should we be worried? And I also think I'm going to take credit for saying that Nick York's bonus was going to be two point seven million in my initial projections as soon as the draft was All right. over. All right. So I just want. You know, did did we too. talk you down before we got information that we should go back up? Is that what uh, happened? Yeah. Because Mike had him around two. Yeah, I, I had it. I had him around two. Yeah. Okay, so. so you win. You win this round. Um, but I think that's, like, expected. I mean, it makes sense yeah. when you coupled with the report that Blaze Jordan's going to sign for $1.75 million, That basically cancels each other out. Yeah. And they've got about nine hundred k left if they go to the full 5% for Wu Yelland and Drohan. Which is kind of right what we projected, yeah. like six hundred K for Drohan, three hundred, three hundred and fifty, because it's a little more than nine hundred. It's like three thirty. Yeah. So yeah, I think that for, yeah. um those two I think the rest of the signings will be announced in short order. Yeah, I think that's because the thing is they needed go. they needed all of them to be in place. And plus I'm sure like the physicals and drug testing are taking longer this year exactly. than typically. Well that's why because Nick York was in Boston today. We know that. Yeah, and he I was like said across the street from Fenway. It was weird. Yeah, did you see the photo? I, I did. I think they said though that they wanted to wait until they got them into Boston. Well, they originally it was Fort Myers, but now Boston before right. announcing them. So I yeah, think that's what they're doing. Chris Cotillo reported that, right? I don't know. Someone did. Yeah. He, I think he said that they were originally going to go to Fort Myers, but they basically had to like change the plans when it turned out that Florida was a disaster zone. 
Yeah. So, so, and I, I think it, the reason they haven't announced Blaze Jordan is like, I, I said at the time when I think Chris said that he heard sources that Jordan was, was, had agreed to a bonus for 175, that they literally could not sign Jordan until York signed. They didn't yeah. have the bonus pool. So they had to sign York. And I suspect that Jordan and the other guys will be announced in short order. Definitely. Yep. I think that sounds right. So we'll keep an eye out for those. Uh, also, COVID 19 diagnoses. Um, Red Sox have had four players test positive for yeah. COVID-19. Uh, one of them being Bobby Dahlbeck, the best prospect in camp, uh, guy who moved up to number five in our new rankings from six in, uh, certainly not ideal. He is not in Boston yet. He's still in Arizona. Uh, yeah, cause other, he got it at home. Cause he got it at home. The other positive well, all these tests, guys got it at home. We yeah, should say that. Yeah. Cause the other positive tests are Eduardo Rodriguez, Eduardo Rodriguez, uh, Josh Taylor, and Darwins and Hernandez. Taylor and Dahlbeck are both in Arizona, and Hernandez and Rodriguez are both in Florida, I believe. I believe, yeah. Yeah, so there and I you think, go. I believe they're all asymptomatic. Or am I, no, Rodriguez no. is not. Yeah, Dahlbeck, Dahlbeck is asymptomatic. Is. Yeah. Rodriguez I, is feeling better. I think yeah, they, they didn't extract, they didn't, like, specify how bad his symptoms were yeah he just said he's feeling better whatever that means because we know like freddie freeman for example has like a bad case of it yeah so yeah so much so that it scared nick marcakis into opting out yeah that was interesting yeah um i I think we should briefly mention to david price opting out because that actually matters for the red sox like salary cap wise well we Um, well no 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 no. we don't know what that it does it might we don't know it could yes you're right i mean monetarily yeah so David Price opted out, in which case he's not a high-risk player, so he doesn't get paid or service time, um, which means the money the Red Sox are going to send to the Dodgers this year to help offset his contract, they do not pay. Um, prorated-wise, it saves them like $6 million, I think, was the amount that it, uh, that yeah, it winds up it saving like them. Yeah, I $5.6 million. $5.6 million, something, million something. something like that, yeah. Um, we don't know yet that they will save that on the CBT uh, basically because that hasn't been negotiated yet. They don't know how the CBT is going to work this year, which my question is, when are you planning to negotiate this MLB and MLB? I mean, I think they've shown they don't really like to do things out in front. It's kind of a, let's, you know, we'll, we'll handle that eventually last minute. I guess. I mean, it's, it's going to be a sticking point. I just, I don't know. Anyway, um, maybe they were waiting to see how many players opted out too. Who knows? Um, but at any rate, we don't know. It's possible that it means the Red Sox have even more space under the CBT than they thought they were going to have this year, in which case they could be able to do things, for example, like trade for Will Myers in, over, in order to buy prospects from the Padres. Um, that's really the one thing that's mostly come up. Also, the Red Sox have been linked with Yasiel Puig, which – I don't get me neither. <laughs> the Myers thing, I kind of get because he could oh, play sure. him at first base. He's a perfect platoon partner with Moreland, and he also could play in the outfield as a platoon partner yeah. with Pilar. Because let's be honest, like you don't want Jackie Bradley facing lefties, and I'm Andrew Benintendi and Verdugo. I'm sure we'll need day offs, and you're going to yeah. want to do that against the lefty. So sure. it'd be great to get two righty bats in the lineup, right? But I think the issue they're going to run into is with the Padres now is that with the DH, they actually have a spot to play Myers. Well, so. but the, the point is that they don't want to pay him, though. Yeah, no, I get that. So I, I don't know. So, but, but I think part of why they didn't want to pay him was because they had nowhere to play him either. Right. Well, the thing is, is his – well, but his contract goes for three more years. Right, no. So, so – but, but yeah. the, the, the point that I made on our forum, Ian, is that, you know, they were like, well, the Padres, you know, they're, they're, they're cutting – employee salaries and things like that they need to, they want to get them off their books it's like well the red sox also cut employee salaries yeah the red sox cut employee salaries significantly not, more than a lot of teams did do we know that yeah like i mean i know a lot i know of several other teams well, in worse markets who were like 10 percent or no cut and the yeah. red sox were what 30 percent for the highest paid it was like 20 percent for most of yeah. them yeah i mean they also didn't lay anybody off like the Angels did or for well, a little no, bit. I, I know, but like so, look at the Royals. The Royals arguably are right. not as good a market. They didn't cut anyone's salary and they haven't furloughed right. anyone. So, right. But anyway, point being, the thing is, is that when you're cutting employee salaries and then you're flexing your financial muscle to buy prospects, that's not a good look. 
You know what I'm saying? So like, even if the Padres want to basically sell Myers using prospects, to me, you wait to make that deal until next year. Just because it's, it's you, even just for the literal reason of if you're going to do that, why aren't you just reinstating employee salaries? Well, and the trade off though to that, I would say though, is you're not going to get as good prospects if it's only for two years. So that's the why you would do it now. Sure, is baseball fair. terms, it's better to do it now if that makes sense. Fair. They're just going to need to brace themselves for the blowback. I think if that's something they wind up doing, because it's going to. Yeah, get I think mentioned. it's more the. Inter- I think the internal blowback is what you'd have to like. Sure, more, internal like, blowback, but then the internal blowback is going to lead to the media blowback because someone's going to say something to someone from the Globe or something. Yeah, true. Or like a so I, don't, I, I don't know. So we'll see what happens. Yeah. We'll see what happens with that. Um, international free agency got pushed back, Ian. Uh, we had mentioned on the podcast before that the owners reserved the right to push back the July 2 signing date to January of 2021, and they have in fact done that. So we do not have international free agent signings to discuss on this episode of the podcast, unfortunately, which is too bad because the Red Sox have been linked Link. to handing out some pretty hefty bonuses. They've got a couple of seven-figure guys. Apparently. Yeah, so I'm like kind of torn on this one. On the one hand, I get it because like they wouldn't even be able to do the Tricky League this year, so these guys True-ish. aren't going to play anyway. So. So if they get it, if it's in January, as long as they're able to play next like summer, they don't have to sit out a full year, then I think it's fine. But on the other hand, I understand from the player's perspective, it sucks because a lot of these players, this is life-changing money that they were oh, anticipating sure. getting in July, and now they're not getting it. So Yeah, yeah that, that part of it is kind of awful. Um, but, I mean, what are you going to do? I, I just, I don't know. Um, yeah, it's a tough one. It is tough. It is tough. Um, and finally, the one thing I did want to mention is that MLB Pipeline is doing, as part of their kind of coverage right now, top position groups across the game. So it's not like top 10 first baseman, top 10 third baseman. It's like top 10, you know, team corner infield groups, top 10 team catching depth, um, that kind of thing. And the Red Sox have been in the top 10 at two positions. Uh, at the corner infield and at the middle infield, Ian, they were, I think, eight or nine. They were eight and one and nine and another, and I, my internet's incredibly slow right now, so I can't really bring them up. But we had mentioned in our State of the System episodes, Ian, that the third base, or sorry, the corner infield depth is pretty good. You've got a blue chipper in Costas. You've got a guy who's close to the majors in Dahlbeck. You've got some interesting guys underneath. Um, so that really wasn't a huge surprise to me, but... At first, the middle infield one was a surprise, but then I thought it through and it really wasn't. You've got a blue chipper and Jeter Downs, and then you've got, you know, kind of the slew of depth that we did talk about with guys like Bonacci, guys like now that they've added Nick York, and actually they had Blaze Jordan in the other corner infield, um, the corner infield one as well, in addition to Dahlbeck and Casas. But you've got Bonacci, you've got York, you've got CJ Chatham. Um, you know, got below that, you've got like a Flores and a, and a Rafaela. It, there's, I don't, I don't know if I'm forgetting anyone obvious, but, uh, oh, Matthew Lugo was the other guy I was thinking of in kind of that Bonacci Chatham York range. So there's some depth there post yeah. draft. Yeah. I think it kind of like goes back to the state of the system series we did. And when you discuss like those two positions with the verdict for the middle of the field was, uh, basically just because of the additions over the last year, which is downs, uh, Lugo, Cannon, um, the international guys, and then now York. Mm-hmm. Um, this group has a fair amount of depth and upside, although most of it is years away. And I think that's the part that kind of threw us off, threw you off is like the years away part. Because other than Downs and Chatham, like they are, you know, all in the low minors, but they just have so much volume down there that I think it almost cancels it out. And at the end of the day, in right. a system, if you have one blue chipper at a position and then depth, that's good enough to be in the top ten. Yep. Yeah, for sure. And I mean, that's those are going to be the only positions that they're on there for. Um, I don't know if I think they're done at this point and they weren't on any of the other ones. So, um, yeah, but it was like, interesting to see them recognized yeah, that then, way. Like, obviously, with corner, we talked about that it was arguably their like deepest in the system. So, yeah. Yeah. What was the other? Oh, we were saying low minors pitching, but they're not doing that kind of distinction. No, no um, they do left and right handed. And if you do it that way, the Red Sox aren't going to be on there, no, obviously. Of course not. Definitely not. Uh, the other kind of quick news note we should mention is that MLB came out with a statement, I guess, that its interpretation of contracts and, and you know the state of things right now is that they cannot stop minor leaguers 
from signing with independent league teams while their contracts are suspended, their minor league contracts, which they are. Teams are still paying them, but it's kind of like an out of the goodness of their heart stipend type deal um, or out of the goodness of their being publicly shamed in the case of the A's and the uh, Nationals. So the Red Sox had their first, I guess he's like a men's league signee. He's not even an indie league signee. But Brendan Salucci, the left-hander they drafted out of Tulane last year, uh, is going to pitch for the, what, what are they called, Ian? The, what, the, the, the team name is the Juice Pigs. Like, yeah. Like Corky and the Juice Pigs. For it's an interesting are, team name. I don't even, where is it, Texas, I would assume? No, I don't, I don't know. The Alpha Athletics... Juice Pigs of Haddonfield. I thought it was like Jersey. Of where? Excuse Haddonfield. Me? Hatfield? <laughs> Hattonfield. No, hat, with two Ds. Um, yeah, I mean, so I, I didn't, I've been meaning to tell you, Ian, that I actually have So it's actually my own. not in Jersey. It is in Pennsylvania. It's Pennsylvania. Okay, I knew it was kind of in the Northeast. Yeah. Um, and then, it's, of course, it's oh, funny. No, it's Jersey. Wait a second. Oh, it's in a Pennsylvania league, though. Oh, uh, okay, that is. makes sense, yeah. Yeah, so it's like a borderline indie league slash men's league team. Yeah, so I think it's kind of like the equivalent of for anyone who's familiar with the Yaki League, like the men's league in Boston. Like I've got a buddy who play, plays in the Yaki League in Boston for the Rockies. Um, it's like it's basically like a men's league that like their championship is at Fenway. Like it's actually kind of a relatively big deal apparently, but um, it's kind of funny because like so Salucci is obviously like retweeting this team's tweets and tonight they played the team that monet davis pitches for the the of course people will remember she was the the female who pitched in the little league world series and was actually like real good yeah. um she's pitching in this men's league uh but yeah it, it's kind of funny i mean it's it's interesting i don't know how i feel about it because on the one hand it's good these guys can get reps when there's not going to be a whole lot going on on the other hand, you just got to make sure you sign with the right team that you're not going to get overused by a coach that i mean you just need to be smart like salucci probably needs to say like look i'll pay, i'll throw three innings a pop if i have a 30 pitch inning i'm coming out like well i i would i would assume the red Sox have given him instruction about what his usage is going to be right i find it hard to believe it it hasn't like and i think it makes sense he's from philadelphia so he's from the area and yeah i mean he only threw 12 innings last year with lowell he only threw 54 overall he's a relief guy so i doubt he would be throwing more than like two inning stints and, but we don't know yeah, he's a relief guy. I mean, he pitched all in relief in college, except for one start, and he threw I mean, all in relief with Lowell last year. So did I mean? Well, I guess with Lowell last year, but that he signed late. I, I don't know. I I mean, Thad Ward was mostly a reliever in college. Yeah, but he started with Lowell. Like it was pretty yeah, obvious no, when he went to Lowell that he was going to move to the rotation. That's fair. Um, but, we'll see. Uh, we'll see with some. I, I anyway. just don't. I yeah. It'll be interesting to follow and see how many of these guys end up like signing with indie ball teams. But I suspect that if I had to guess, I don't think we'll see like the higher end guys, like the top twenty ish guys, sign with indie ball teams. But I think we'll see a plethora of like the next tier, like that thirty to sixty, right. and then obviously unranked guys signing with teams. Yeah, I think that sounds right. Guys in the U.S. who need to play. I think the Red Sox want them to do that. That's how they're going to get reps. So that was kind of an interesting note we wanted to mention. Uh, good luck to the juice pigs. <laughs> anyway, all right. Well, on to the, let's, let's get to the meat and potatoes, Ian. The new rankings, which came out on July the 3rd. And I guess a good place to start before we start on what happened in the re-rank, Ian, is maybe take people through the thought process behind even doing a new ranking. Right. So in a typical season, we will do full re-ranks once a month. And our process is that Ian, myself and Mike Andrews, the editor in chief of the site, each produce a list of it used to be 70 and somehow it became 75 just kind of naturally, I think, which I'm not complaining about because it leads to more accurate rankings. Um, but we rank out to 75 and average them we talk about the average ranking we kind of talk through why we have guys differently and things like that not that we need to agree but just it's good to kind of hear i want to hear your thoughts you know i want to hear mike's thoughts mike wants to hear our thoughts you probably don't care about our thoughts but i'm just kidding 
Yeah, no, he agrees. He's shaking his head. But at any rate, it's good to talk through it, and we kind of move guys around, and then we determine you know, what the final list is going to look like, and we come up with the list. What we will then do during like the off season. so the last time we did the full re-rank was end of last season, end of 2009, so that would be like October. I think we would have done it right when you got back from, from Instructs. Correct. In the off season, when new players come in, we'll obviously add them. If we get new information on a guy that we think merits an immediate move in the rankings, we will do that. And then this March, when our trip to spring training got scuttled, we did a kind of, you know, let's move four or five guys because we knew we wanted to move, for example, Brainer Bonacci, right? We knew we wanted to move him up because he was in like the 40s or the 50s or something. And we're like, okay, based on new information we've gotten, he should be in the top 20. You know, AJ Politi, we kind of looked at it as like, ah, we were too low on him. We wanted to move him up. And those were guys who we originally were like, well, let's see what they look like in camp. We'll see if what we see squares with wanting to move them. When we then weren't going to see these guys, it's like, well, let's just get this done now. Let's just move them. And we had done that a couple times. We'd done that moving a few guys around, like we said, putting new guys in. But just it was time to kind of do a new ranking in. And, and then we were we had several reasons why – we wanted to do a re rank, and I've been doing a lot of talking. Do you want to talk about some of the reasons that we had to do a full re rank at this point, even though there have not been games to base them on? We have not really seen guys. Sure, um, I think you did a really good write up for the news page about oh. it too. If you want like a well, more detailed um, breakdown, but really there were kind of three or four ish um, reasons, a few of them, and um, big ones, and then some other smaller ones. And I think that the biggest one was just we got new data you know we're constantly talking to sources and people who are see have seen them uh either in spring training this year or saw them in workouts over the winter or even going back to last season just new people we're connecting with so we're always updating our scouting reports um based on that information that we get and so i think that was number one was we wanted to account for because there were like prospects playing in major league spring training games there were workouts going on that people were seeing so we had information based on that uh the second part big one was the new draftees obviously um Mm -hmm. that was we had to rank them somewhere and kind of we had to figure out how they fit they fit in with the rest of the thing and that's why some of the guys who moved down didn't really move down they just moved down naturally because the three draftees went ahead of them for example right and then i think the last thing is kind of like i combine these all into one thing and it's just the weird 2020 season and so (laughs) it's the lack of a minor league season obviously so for some guys i which i think we'll talk about more in depth when we get into those players you could talk Um, about them here too i mean but yeah i think the three the three this was most applicable to was noah song jay groom and ryan fitzgerald and then um similarly kind of the who was who made the player pool and who didn't and then going into 2021 there are certain guys who potentially you know are minor league free agents or something which changed that we might not see them play again for the red sox so we had to kind of reevaluate based on that yeah and it's just kind of like you know look are we are we keeping the get these guys in there when there might be minor league free agents when we've got these guys coming up from the dsl who we were maybe reserving judgment on until we saw them and it's like well we may not see them until next spring training you know we've got enough data that we can rank them let's go for it so, you know, there were things like that. Um, and even, you know, just doubling back to the reports and data, we've, you know, we've also gotten data from last season from, from sources as well. Well, that's so, what I said. Like, it's, right. you know. Okay, yeah. I, th- I thought you just said new stuff. No, I said, like, camp. we're, you know, okay, we're sorry. expecting new people or hearing more stuff from last season. Right. That is kind of just maybe it's, you know, filling a hole of a certain guy we didn't get to, like, an information gap of a guy we didn't get to see it that much or – it could just be something new because like we saw the guy at the beginning of the season or in the mm-hmm. middle of the season, this person mm-hmm. saw him at the end. So we're kind of just like plugging those gaps and getting a more complete picture of certain players. Yeah. And there's another piece of that too, where in producing the content we've continued to produce, like for example, the state of the system series, um, you know, where we, there were a few guys we looked at and it's like, huh, didn't realize that this guy was like death to left handers. Right. Like, or that, you know, this guy, Maybe his season wasn't as good as I thought it was. You know, maybe he just started hot and kind of tailed off, but his numbers remained good because of how hot he was to start off. Um, Things like that that just, you know, as we're continuing to look at guys, I don't want to lock myself into a ranking just because that's where we had a guy. 
right? And I'm the one who, when we rank, I'm often like, why are we changing this ranking? What has changed since last month? If there's an answer, cool. And sometimes the answer is, look, I looked again at him and I was wrong and with where I had him last month. It would be silly to continue ranking a guy in the same spot just because that's where you had him, you know? So that was part of it too. So that was the thinking behind the re-rank. And we talked through all of this and then we, you know, did our full rankings process, which we just, we haven't done in a while. Um, so let's get into it, Ian. And, you know, there was a lot of movement. Um, if you bring up actually the, our ranking spreadsheet, Ian, I've already adjusted for the draftees. So the change in the change column is legitimate change. So, for example, you know, Matthew Lugo rising from 15 to 12 is actually a four-spot jump because Nick York came in ahead of him, for example, right? So um, the biggest changes in the top 10 – were two players who you mentioned. Noah Song moves up from 9 to 4. Jay Groom falls from 4 to 8. So let's talk about that really quick. Um, Song, we mentioned the news last episode that he is at flight school. But of course, the fact that there is no season for anybody this year really does mitigate that. And so we, we moved him up. It's not as much of a problem. He may be back as soon as next May. If that's the case, he's not missing a ton. I mean, he's missing development. And so it wasn't an automatic, like, yep, bump him back up to four. To me, I did have to think about it. Um, You know, Mike still had him at six. I think that's still an incredibly, that's perfectly defensible. I have no problem with where he ranked him. Um, You and I both had him at four. But it was just kind of, it's not as big of a deal. And then Jay Groom... He's going to be Rule 5 eligible in the fall, and he's going to have 70 professional innings, including playoff games. That's just, that's not good. Um, I don't know if you want to jump in. Yeah, no, I think just on song first. Um, I think we talked about it a little bit last season when they kind of, after we saw him in Lowell, that he's probably the second, first or second most talented righty in the system, and it's pretty clear. But just because of there was so much uncertainty about his timeline, that's why I had him where I did, which was like in the back half of the top 10. Yep. Um, and it fully acknowledging that if we knew he was playing fully or we had a more definite thing, he could move into the top five. Mm-hmm. And I think, as you said, it's once we had that information, I was comfortable putting him where his talent you know, is right. Is supposed has should have him. Um, whereas before it was more of a hedge balancing the talent and the thought that he could miss two full seasons of dev- development. Now with the potential that he might miss like three months of actual games, it made me feel a lot more comfortable putting him where he did. And I think kind of well, we're right. on song. We should address. We had a really good question on Twitter that I think actually, I didn't realize, but both of us answered it um, oh, yeah. Yeah. from a listener asking why we dropped his floor to two. When we said that if he was available to play right now, there's a non-zero chance he could pitch in the majors as a reliever this year. Right. And let me and, actually, before you go, I'll let you answer it. Let me just preface by what we're talking about with the ranking. So, or with the grades. So we, yes. we when we grade players, we do a projection, a floor, and a ceiling. Um, and you can go to the about page on the Sox Prospects website. It has at the bottom our scale that we rank on, and it's projecting what the player will be in the majors. The projection is what you know, roughly what we project the player to be. The floor and ceiling are the realistic floor and ceiling. Yes, any player could, in theory something should click and they become a Hall of Famer, right? We're never going to project that. It's like realistically based on what they are now, what could they become? Uh, so for example, Tristan Costas, we project them as a role five player, uh, a role, not rule, role five player, um, which is, you know, MLB regular, um, you know, what's the war on that? You know, I can pull it up, but I don't remember. Uh, four floor, seven ceiling, seven ceiling is like, you know, all star every year. You know, one of the top 30 players in the game, top 40 players in the game. You know, that's his realistic ceiling. Four floor is like a up and down guy. Um, so for Song, we changed his projection. We kept him as a projected 4.5 on the scale, four and a half guy. For, you'll hear referred to as a 45. Um, but we dropped his floor to a two, kept the ceiling at a six. And I'll let you get into why we did that. Yeah, I, I, so I just think that – and the question I, I wanted to look to see who it was from, it was from uh, at Chase Robertson. Um, and 
the reason that I said, and I think I didn't realize this at the time, is you and I actually said the exact same thing, basically. <laughs> right. Which is great. Um, was It was kind of twofold. It was, I just, I don't think it's likely, but at, there is a non-zero chance that he never comes back to play baseball. And so if he never comes back to play baseball, he's obviously not a prospect. So you have to like kind of account for that. Right. And then the other one is he comes back. If let's say hypothetically, he's not able to throw for all the time when he's, you know, in flight school or he's not working out and he comes back and his stuff is just gone. Mm -hmm. We had to account for that risk. And that's why he has the low floor, but his ceiling remains the same. Yeah. And it's like, you know, a lot of people could say it's it's like he's having Tommy John. I wouldn't even say it's that. Because when you have Tommy John, you can at least do rehab stuff. Like, yeah, you're not pitching in games, but you're continuing to work on your craft. He's not pitching full stop. Like, he's not interacting with the club. He's not. He's at flight school. He's concentrating on flight school. To me, the better, like, if you're going to make an injury analogy, I'd say it's almost like a guy with thoracic outlet syndrome. You know, the, the, that, like, you know, Daniel Bard had the surgery where they, like, they remove the guy's rib or something. Like... It's you've just lost the feel to pitch, right? You just can't throw. It's entirely possible he comes back and his feel for his slider is gone. That his velocity is down like exactly four miles per hour. That, you know, the change up he flashed in the last year, he basically not forgets how to throw it, but just, you know, like the, in a physical memory sense, muscle memory sense, just can't throw it anymore. Not saying we think that's going to happen, but that's possible. And if that happens, he's a two. So that's why we made that change. So good, good job calling that out, Ian. I had forgotten about that. Uh, it was a very, very good question. Um, those were really the big movers in the top 10. Ian, I don't know, for, for the top 20, we had some movement. Um, a lot of it's draft pick related, though. Yeah, you know, but, it's, it's, but, but the thing is, like I said, the changes that are on here are not, they're accounting for the draftees coming in. Yeah. So, for example, like... Um, you know, Connor Wong was one guy who I, maybe, uh, to me, was a guy I, I thought a lot more about where he dropped from 12 to 17, which is really a net minus three because of, of the, oh, we should mention Nick York and plays Jordan um, yeah. real quick. We'll do that next. But like Wong, for example, a guy who we haven't been able to see, but I just looked back and read the reports again, and it's just, okay, he's a guy who can catch and also play second and third. He's got a lot of pop, which is great. But at the plate, he's got a lot of swing and miss. Defensively, he needs to work to be able to catch in the majors. He hasn't played a whole lot of infield. I just, I got a lot less excited the more I looked into the profile. So that's why I dropped him on my list. And that might have accounted for most of why he dropped, honestly. Uh, yeah, because you was, have the lowest of the three of us. I, I think the what you said is just it's the K rate for me. Yeah, like a thirty percent K rate in Double A is not good. Yeah. Like the because usually K rate jumps about five percent. Studies have shown when you, a guy moves from the minors to the majors, mm-hmm. and if you're already at thirty percent, you have no wiggle room. Like a thirty five percent K rate is like there's like two people in baseball who run that each year. It's like Joey Gallo and someone else, yeah. and like. Connor Wong doesn't have 95 or 150 power like Joey Gallo does. So <laughs> Right. Well, that's the thing. And it's like when you talk about K-Rate, a guy we've talked about that a lot with is Bobby Dahlbeck. Bobby Dahlbeck's got at least 70 raw, and he's probably got at least 60 in-game. And he was like 25% last year. Yeah, and, when he, and he cut it, which is part of why he moved up in the rankings, right? Um, you know, Baseball America's exactly. got him on their top 100. Yeah. So that's that's the thing with with um, with Wong, for example. But we should mention Nick York made his debut at number eleven. Um, behind, I, I we should mention the top ten from one to ten goes Tristan Casas, Jeter Downs, Brian Mata, Noah Song, Bobby Dahlbeck, Hilberto Jimenez, Jaron Duran, Jay Groom, Thaddeus Ward, Tanner Houck. So they're followed by Nick York making his debut at eleven. Matthew Lugo at 12 and Blaze Jordan making his debut at lucky number 13. Um, Ian, we're kind of flip flopping because we had both said and thought that Blaze Jordan would enter the rankings ahead of Nick York. But the more we thought about it, the more we talked about it. We all went with York ahead of Jordan. Yeah. And I think that was just, we didn't have a lot of information on York at the time. And 
talking to sources and just people around the game, it seemed pr- there was a lot of negativity surrounding Jordan or not negativity. Should I say question marks? Yeah. Kind of like what we talked about with Jim Callis, you know, or if you've read some of the recaps of some of the other like um, draft experts talking about Blaze Jordan, there are definitely red flags and the profile is interesting. Whereas talking to people about York, like there are still question marks with him, but at least people are pretty confident he can hit. And mm-hmm. so I think it just kind of, we ended up determining that. And I think another aspect that I don't know if this impacted is like, if you look, the Red Sox were confident enough in York to give him 2.7 million, whereas they only gave Jordan 1.7 million, that million dollar difference is significant. And it's pretty clear that they valued York significantly more than Jordan by those bonus figures. Cause if they didn't, they would have just taken Jordan in the first round or whatever, not necessarily, but you know what I mean? Like money wise, the people who said, well, why didn't they draft Jordan in the first and York in the third? Well, part of it is if York's number was 2.7 and they wanted both. That's yeah. the order you had to draft them in. Exactly. And so I just think that it just made sense to have York ahead yeah. after getting that additional info. Because our, our, that first, you know, when we first said that, it was really just based on, you know, looking at like the grades based on of the the major publications and then reading those reports because we didn't have time to get in our own information. But once we were able to start gathering that, it seemed pretty clear to put York ahead. Yeah. And I mean, you know, I think there's a certain amount of inertia when you're talking about dr- amateur prospect rankings and you know when you've got a guy like jordan who people have known about since he was 13 right he's a name he's done all the showcases you know that sort of thing and you've got a guy in york who is not a name was injured last year not a lot of people saw him i think the the conviction the red sox have in nick york was a data point that moved him for me and that's why I, i put him he's at now, he's actually at 13 in my rankings, but I have no problem with putting him 11. I have no problem with where he is. So, um, you know, I think part of it is it's it's a little bit of, of throwing darts at a, dar- at a dartboard with draftees because how do you compare a guy you've never seen based only on scouting reports with a guy you've seen? Yeah. You know, it's just really hard to make an apples-to-apples apples comparison there. But we try because that's what we have to do, and it's it's fun to talk about and, and discuss mm-hmm. and create conversation, and we love that. You could think we're way off and say, if you came to me with a well-reasoned argument that Nick York should be like 20th in the system, I don't know that I would argue with you that much. It's a defensible position. Um, I think another thing is, too, you kind of have to look at it more as like the tier they fit in. And I kind of think that from about 10 to 20 is like a tier. And I'd I'd go to 22 or 22 even. And I think you could make an argument to order them in Mm -hmm. pretty much any way, just like with like I'd have Tanner Houck on the higher side, for example, or I'd have York on the higher side. But you can pretty much order those guys however you want. It's a lot of personal preference. So I don't think there's a lot of difference, in my opinion, on how. And I, I remember making my rankings like the top nine was very easy for me to make. And then Hauk at 10 was pretty easy. But then after that, yeah. I, I went back and forth a lot on those guys. That's Yeah, I would say the tier is 11 to 22. And if you, you rank them in any order, I as long as you had reasons, I, yeah, I would have a problem with it. Um, yeah, we had the same eight guys. and We had the same one, two, three. Well, we, we had, had the same guys in the top 22. Did we? Yeah. Okay, well, there you go. Yeah, I mean, that's the thing is we had the same guys, one, two, three. We had the same five guys in some order from four to eight. We all had Thaddeus Ward nine. We all had Tanner Houck 10. And then we had the same 11 guys from 11 to 22. So there you go. Um, And I mean, if you want to expand it out, like we actually had the same guys in the top 20. Oh, no, we didn't actually. Never mind, because I had one outlier. It was me, actually. Um, But we had pretty much the same guys. No, top 27. No, top Oh, yeah, That's, Flores, never mind. Yeah, so we had pretty okay. much all but one of the top 27 were consensus in that somewhere in there, too. So, yeah. Right. Or top 26, you mean? Yeah. Yeah. Um, they all, but yeah, the top 26 weren't all top. Anyway, whatever. Fair enough. Um, other kind of guys worth mentioning, Ian, I don't really... I don't know. Um, guys we should mention. Uh, the, the other draftee who dropped in at 32 was Shane Drohan. I think that's right about where we thought he would be. Um, yeah. You know, potential for an athletic kind of starting pitcher. Uh, and then Jeremy Wu Yellen's debuts at 57. 
yeah. uh, the lefty out of Hawaii. Right. I, I think the ones we should talk about maybe it's like the Pedro Castellanos, Brandon Howlett, Sedane Raffaella crew. And I think those guys, for me, they they all Let's, dropped pretty significantly. Well, I mean, okay, so Castellanos and Howlett were 24 and 25. They each dropped four spots. And then Sedan Raffaella dropped from 22 to 33, which is a net minus eight. Uh, Howlett and Raffaella have pretty high K rates. I think Howlett's was over 30% last year, and Raffaella's was sneaky high, which I had not realized. Um, that's on me. Um, <laughs> but having seen him, it makes sense. Like, he just, he just tries to hit home run every time he's up, yeah. and he's five foot seven, so it doesn't really play. Um, and then Castellanos is a weird one. His strikeout rate isn't that high, but he has a lot of swing and miss in his game. And I just, we kind of, with his lack of position versatility, he had to move down. So I think those are kind of why those guys moved down was, um, yeah. just some concerning information we got about their, uh, their swing and miss in their game. Yeah. And some guys moved, I think Ian, because it was just our first chance to re-rank, um, you know, like so. For example, Luis Perales was a guy that we've been getting great reports on, mostly from Ben Badler all off season, and we had kind of just goosed him up, just just because we knew he should move up, right? It's like, okay, this guy should be in I mean, the top. 40. Yeah, we Let's got reports from Badler had stuff. We we got our own independent information about okay. him too. That okay, caught, that that was more important to me than the Badler stuff personally. Okay, well, okay, right. I didn't know if I forgot about that actually with him. But anyway, I think we just we we had an opportunity to rank him, and he wound up higher. Um, he moved up from 46 to 40, um, which is actually a net gain of nine spots considering three draftees went in ahead of him. So he was a guy that actually moved a lot. Um, let's see, Kyle Hart based, I think, mostly. I, I know you didn't move him that high, but yeah. for me and Mike, for me it was just, you know, they valued him enough to protect him from Rule 5. I mean, he's going to be like their number five starter this year. So. Right. Well, that's the thing. And it's just, it's just, is his type of player more valuable in a opener type league, right? A guy who could come in and be the long reliever. Um, is that the type of guy they see him as? So, I mean, it, it's a, it, look, he's, no, he's 42. We didn't move him up to 15, right? Um, some other guys who moved up a lot, a, a lot of the guys who are either moving up from the Dominican Summer League in or who are, in the Dominican Summer League, whenever it comes back, would have been there this year. So, for example, Nathaniel Cruz is a guy that we heard is – we heard that he was at 95. Did we just – I think we just heard he's like 97 or he like posted video he, of him. He posted video. He's up to 97 now. Yeah, which so – And as a 17-year-old, is very good. Yeah, so we so, moved yeah. him up from 59 to 50, which is actually – But he's also a guy that we got information on too over the offseason that we hadn't taken into account in the well, rankings yet. Well, no, we had taken it into account into making sure he was ranked already we so just we had done we had done a proper re-rank, re-rank with that information. exactly so that's what it is is that you know you in particular had him had him high and i'm not, not anything that i would argue about it's just you know these are things that we're considering um eduardo vaughn was a guy that we did not rank but wound up at number 51 based on information we got um some other guys who fit some archetypes that we just talked about robinson layer moves up from 56 to 52 um, which is a net gain of seven because he's on the taxi squad or on the player pool. Sorry, it's not the taxi squad. Uh, I mean, he's he, still at camp too. He's not like he's on the. Uh, he's, he's still not over like big league camp. He's yeah. not even over BC. Yeah. So he, I mean, he's a guy that they're looking at, which is, you know, look. I mean, he had been in camp all the way to the until camp shut down, and now he's still in camp, which can't be said for everyone who was in camp, which we'll talk about in a minute. Um, then meanwhile, Ryan Fitzgerald dropped from 35 to 53. You in particular, Ian, were, were big on the reasoning here. So I'll kick that one to you. And if you want to talk about any of the guys I just mentioned, and I just threw a bunch of names out there. Um, yeah. So on Fitzgerald, I just, I had a problem with, he's going to be a 27 year old next season who has never played above a ball and has no power. And he enters the year at 26, enters the year at 26. And I just, I understand he obviously got a late start and everything because of indie ball, but I just don't. I think the odds of him being a significant major leaguer, even you know, by the time if he proceeds along the standard development curve, we're looking at a guy who's like 29 and making his big league debut. If he even gets there, and I just don't think that's that valuable in this day and age. Um, and I think that if the Red Sox kind of th- thought he had a significant future, they have plenty of spots in their squ- in their uh, open like on their taxi squad or no, it's sorry, bo- their player pool player is what pool. we should call it. Um, 
to fit him in if they if they thought you know he was someone that they had in their future plans significantly and i just him missing this year i just don't you know i didn't know what to do with a guy that age and i just when i looked at it i liked you think i prefer the younger you know the guys who i think have more of an upside who they, yeah it's more unknown but i just don't think fitzgerald has the profile of someone who belongs in the top 60 yeah i think that sounds right um i think that sounds right it's it's Hey, I mean, you know, he he dropped. He, you had him low, much lower than myself or Mike did, but it, it's a matter of like three spots or something. He winds up moving if you have him higher, so it's not a huge deal. Uh, it's a concern. It's a concern. It's not that he can't pan out. It's the likelihood. Is a and lot it just yeah, it just came down to you know, am I taking the sixteen year old throwing ninety seven or seventeen year old throwing ninety seven, or am I taking a soon to be twenty seven year old middle infielder with no power? Like, yeah, and I just, at the end of the day, I'm taking the upside, and I just yeah. don't see it. Fitzgerald has the upside. I mean, like, look, I think it, he could be a solid minor leaguer for them, you know, but you can sign that guy as a minor league free agent, right? I mean, look at it this way: like Kirby Yates happens to use a guy we were talking about before we started recording, right? Like. That's the thing that happens. You don't project Kirby Yates happening. You don't project the guy becoming one of the best relievers well, in baseball in 2019 when he was when, graduating high school in 2005. When that does happen, it, it tends to skew towards pitchers more than hitters. Sure. Like, for every Daniel Nava, there's like you know five or ten, or probably way more than that, pitchers who at least establish themselves as middle relievers coming out of nowhere. Mm -hmm. Whereas position player wise, you can probably name on you know, one hand, the number who have made the big leagues close to their third as a 30 year old for the first time and ever become like something of note. Right. Um, we should mention guys who fell out in, um, in particular, I want to mention three. I, I don't really know what happened to one or two of these guys, but, um, Nick Longy, Josh Ockamy and Denny, Denny Reyes. Uh, frankly, it's just, Frankly, it's the fact that they weren't on the player pool. Um, Nick Longy was in camp uh, when camp shut down. They did not bring him in for the player pool. I think basically you can trace it to the fact that they signed Yairo Munoz, uh, essentially almost directly, um, and and the fact that Nick Verdu that uh, Nick Verdugo Alex Verdugo got healthy. Uh, Alex Verdugo, he's friends with Alfredo Soriano. Uh, but yeah, Nick Longy not being in camp is not great for a guy they signed as a minor league free agent. It seems like that's kind of the point and he's not there. Maybe they'll add him, who knows? And, and maybe we'll consider that fact if they do, but, uh, I, I don't know. I'm, I, that's not a good look for a guy they signed as a minor league free agent. Uh, Josh Ockamy, same thing. He's going to be a minor league free agent this off season. He's gone unselected in consecutive rule five drafts and they didn't bring him into camp. I think it's very possible he's played his last game with the Boston Red Sox, if not probable. I think, yeah. Uh, and then Denny Reyes, look, he was on the 40 at one point, but they DFA'd him. He went unclaimed this offseason, and he's not there right now for the player pool. Didn't like what, just, it doesn't work. I, I mean, you know, I saw him last year, didn't love what I saw. He pitches backwards. It, I don't think the stuff works in the bullpen. I don't think it's a starter. I just... I th he strikes me as the kind of guy that's going to get to Triple A, be okay, and then just leave as a minor league free agent. Uh, frankly, so you know, might he put up good numbers? I mean, I feel like it's going to be a lot like a Teddy Stankowitz type situation where he goes to Triple A, he's fine, and if you're not paying attention, you say, "Well, why isn't this guy getting a shot?" Uh, but then he just kind of rides off into the sunset. That's kind of what I see happening with Arias. So anyone else, Ian, that I missed? I mean, I, you're kind of looking at the list as well with me. Oh, we should mention guys like Jonathan Diaz falls out from 44 because he's going to be a minor league free agent. <laughs> he's probably not getting re-signed. Maybe he yeah, resigns. Yeah, we have the hedge that the odds are these guys are not going to be back with the Red Sox. And even so. if he resigns, it's the fact that he's going to be a minor league free agent having not pitched above Salem. Yeah. Like, that's not a good. significant injury track record, yeah. Yeah. So I know I think we've kind of hit on everyone that we needed to. Yeah, yeah. So, I mean, check them out. If you've got questions on any of the rankings, why guys moved the way they did, why they're ranked where they are, uh, check it out. It's SoxProspects.com. Uh, it's right on the front page, and then you go to more prospects to get 21 to 60. So um, would love to hear your questions on that, on grades, or anything like that. Uh, speaking of your questions, like I promised, we have a couple of emails we want to get to that we had had in the hopper. And, Ian, I guess I'll start with yours from our friend Jake Devereaux over at Over the Monster. 
Um, Jake says, hey, guys, long-time listener, first-time question asker. Could you guys rank your top 10 pitching development successes of the John Henry era Red Sox? Uh, this would date back to the first class that Henry and crew were responsible for drafting all the way until present day. I'm looking for your take on what constitutes a successful outcome and if your top 10 list is different from my own. Uh, I appreciate the great work that you guys that you guys do on the website and on the podcast in which you continued success at SoxProspects.com. Thanks, Jake De- Devereaux. Thank you, Jake. Uh, great question. We've been kind of holding this one in the hopper because it requires kind of a deeper look. We should mention that I know he said... Um, date back to the first class that Henry and crew were responsible for drafting. We went back to 2002. I don't know. You might want to consider it like 2003 really being the first John Henry era class. But here's the thing is that the, well, there's one guy who we're going to talk about who's on that list who at least was mostly developed under the Henry regime, if not drafted. So I think that that counts. So that's what we went with. But Ian, I punted this to you. I let you come up with the list, although I had a little bit of input. Um, what did you come up with? And you can either start with the list, and I think let's start with the list, and then we'll get to the big picture takeaway. Yeah. But let's start um, with the list. Do you want to go 10 to 1, or do you want to go 1 to 10? I think we go 1. Eh, let's go 10 to 1. Okay, 10 to 1. Coming in at the Casey Kasem number 10 list. Uh, I had uh, Jalen Beeks from <laughs> the University of Arkansas. Okay, tell me a little bit about Beeks. Uh, Beeks was drafted in, was it 2016, I think? Is that right? No. 2014? 2014, sorry, in the 12th round. Um, You copy with the more information. He obviously uh, was someone who was kind of unheralded when he was drafted. Um, he signed for, you know, 50 K over slot. So that's a little bit, um, which was a hundred. Th- no, no, it was, Oh, was this was slot a hundred at that point? I thought it yeah, was hundred K. No. Okay. So, so he signed got- for 50, 50 K okay. over slot. Got it. And, um, kind of came into the Red Sox. Not a lot of fanfare. He had a, you know, he went to Greenville as a college junior, which is not ideal in his first year and put up kind of just whatever numbers, you know, four, three RA 145 innings, only a hundred strikeouts. But um, he was just someone who just constantly improved with each level. And then eventually, next thing you know, he's in the high minors and he's putting up like, you know, a 2.89 ERA in Pawtucket in 2018. And he makes his big league debut with Boston. And he was someone who established himself as a legit prospect to the point where the Red Sox were able to flip him for Nadia Valdi, who obviously was key in the Red Sox World Series win in 2018. Mm-hmm. And so I kind of look at it, you know, yes, he did not pitch that much for the Red Sox, but for them to develop a 12th round pick and be able to flip him for an established major leaguer like Eovaldi, um, that's a pretty great development outcome, I think, and why he is on the list at mm-hmm. number 10. All right. Number number nine. Uh, number nine. FM radio I have, DJ voice. <laughs> number nine, I have uh, Junichi Tozawa, who <laughs> nice. was obviously an international signee out of Japan um, back in, what year was it? Uh, 2008, I think. 2000 yeah december 2008 okay. signed for 1.8 million as a 22 year old and i think he was kind of interesting because that was at the time where he was one of the first guys to come over without playing that much in like the japanese professional league or at least well, i think at all in the he, japanese he didn't play for npb at all which is why he was available as a 22 year old he yeah, played which, in the in like industrial league Right, which is not the way things usually proceeded. So right. he kind of came over. He went to Portland for a year, and then he was in Pawtucket a little bit. And he just established himself as a legitimate, you know, big league reliever after you know four seasons in the minors. Um, they turned him into someone who was a key contributor out of the bullpen in 2012, 2013, 2014, 2015. Even started to decline in 2016. Then obviously, he was, I think he was he signed with Miami as a free agent. But, you know, they got four, five, six good years of serviceable bullpen relief out of Tazawa for $1.8 million. So I think that's a pretty big uh, developmental success given what they had to give up. I know he signed a little older, which is why I pushed him a little down the list. But, um, mm-hmm. yeah, I think that's that was a pretty good result. Considering and, it, and it was just throwing money at a guy and letting him go, right? Because they only wound up getting a middle reliever out of him. And it was a question at first of whether he was going to start. He started in Portland and for Pawtucket, and he had four starts in Boston in 2009. Um, but he wound up as a middle reliever, so that's a thing. Mostly because he he got hurt and missed all of 2010. Was that yeah. was that TJ or was that? Uh, I think that was yeah. TJ. yeah, he had TJ. Yeah. So yeah, he had Tommy John surgery in 2010. Uh, Came back as a starter briefly, but then they really. I mean, he I was think, well, he, he was he a starter in the sense that he was starting games, but he wasn't yeah. throwing 
he, but he, he was he was throwing he like the first two innings. He didn't have the stuff to start, and he was or obviously five eleven. So it's just yeah, he was yeah. better as a reliever. But he established himself as one of the better setup guys in baseball for a few years. Yep, for sure. All right, who you got at number eight? Um, number eight, I have someone who is actually not pitched very much in the big leagues, but he kind of a stat came out last year and established himself, and that is Darwinson Hernandez. Okay, um, and why uh, is that? Because he signed for seventy five hundred bucks and is <laughs> basically turned into a legitimate potential like setup guy. Yeah, and I wouldn't rule out. You know, I think there is a non zero chance he has closer stuff. Mm-hmm. Um, get better soon, gonna, Darwinson. The command needs to get there, but. Yeah, he, I mean, last year in Boston, he walked way too many guys, which we knew was going to happen, but mm-hmm. he struck out 57 guys in 30 innings. There you go. That'll play. Um, his FIP was only 2.75. Like, he put up, I think it was, yeah, he was a positive war in 29 innings, pacing at about one for the season. Mm-hmm. So he's just someone who I think they're the best. his best days are ahead of him. And just the more important thing is, you know, that he was a $7,500 signee who has turned into a, a potential legitimate big leaguer. And not better than just, you know, a replacement level player. So that to me is pretty valuable and why he comes in at number eight. All right, number seven. And he's someone I should mention that probably would be much higher on this list. It could be much higher on this list depending in, on how his career progresses. Sure. Um, I think number six and seven can be mentioned together so he doesn't take too long. And they are br- Brandon. Say, we, could, we could probably go quicker through these. Uh, Brandon saying. Workman and Matt Barnes, because I think they're similar profiles. They're both failed starting pitchers who turned into legit relief options. The reason I have Workman ahead is because Workman wasn't as highly regarded as Barnes. Barnes was obviously a first round pick, got a bigger bonus. Whereas Workman, I want to say, was a second round pick or a third yep, round pick. Second. Second round he pick. Was, he was their third p- or fourth pick because they had three first rounders um, between Colburn Vidic. Oh gosh, Colvin Vidic, I forgot him. Yeah, you're right. Bryce, he was Brett and Anthony Renato, so he was yep. the fourth pick. Yeah, in 2010. So yeah, he um I, I they're kind of similar to me. They're both, you know, right now, one's the closer, one's the setup guy, both right handed, both were I mean, Workman though last year was almost like a three war reliever, which is crazy good, whereas Barnes' best season is around like one seven, I wanna say. So I think Workman just and then the combination of two, him being a second round pick, whereas Barnes was a first round pick. Yeah. He was a little, required a little more development. So those two uh, kind of came in next for me. Um, but I think it also, I guess we'll talk about it later. It shows how weak this list is that we have relievers coming in we'll at like six and seven. We'll get there. Well, number um, five's in a reliever too, right? It, well, kind of. He started with the Red Sox. Number five, I have is Justin Masterson. Oh, who, uh, oh, I thought Alex, is Alex Wilson not on your list? No, he didn't make it. I caught him. Okay, fair enough. Um, uh, cause he wasn't good with the Red Sox. He was only, he didn't get good until he was with, uh, Detroit. And he just got DFA, right? Did they trade? I'll, I'll find out. I, it's Maybe. Um, but yeah, Justin Masterson. And I know he's not been good for, Oh, he was in the cesspit of steel. I'm sorry. Okay. Yeah. Um, but J- Justin Masterson was their third round pick, second round pick in 2006. Third, he was their second round pick, but fourth, fifth pick overall. Jeez. Um, in 2006 and he's someone who, you know, he's not been good for a few years now, but at his peak, I mean, he put up with the Red Sox, he had a four, he had a, like a two war or 2.5 war season, then, uh, another almost one war season, um, before he was eventually traded. Um, who's he traded for? Oh no, he was released by the Red Sox. No, the second time around. Yeah. The first time around he was traded. I don't remember for who he went to Cleveland. So that might've been in the Victor. No, no, Victor, Victor, Martinez. Her, Victor Martinez deal. Um, but yeah, yeah, he was traded where and in Cleveland, he had a couple of four and three war years. But with the Red Sox, I mean, in 2008, he was really good. Um, he had, yeah, 88 innings. Uh, one, His ERA best years were with, the, were with the Indians. His best years were with the Indians, but he was a second round pick who they were able to trade as the centerpiece for Victor Martinez. Right. And Former top prospect then. in the system when it was a exactly. good system. So, um, yeah, so he's someone who uh, we have up there in number five. Okay. Um, four. Number four, I have Eduardo Rodriguez. Now, he wasn't obviously signed by the Red Sox, the Orioles did, but he was kind of a mess when the Orioles traded into the Red Sox. He was out of shape. He was kind of hurt a lot. And he really established, re- reestablished his prospect stock, and he's kind of turned into a solid number three, maybe even a, like a number two starter. And um, I throw yeah. two on him easily. Yeah, so he's probably one of the, I would say, one of the top 60 starting pitchers in baseball, and that's quite a result um, given where what he was when he was acquired. And, yeah, that's kind of just – and he's another one who I think could probably pass this next guy for sure if well, things uh, progress in his career. Let me just chime in on Rodriguez and, and the fact that 
I think when they, when they traded for him, the Orioles had a very specific way that they were developing their starting pitchers at that time with what they were having them throw, how they were having yeah, them throw Yeah, they would let them throw, like, breaking balls, right, or something? Or it was like, it, I thought it was the way he threw his changeup or something. Like oh, something no, the yeah. Orioles tried to get him to throw his changeup in the low 80s. That's but after the trade, the Red Sox were like, dude, throw your changeup the way you want to throw your changeup, and that, now his changeup's like 86 to 88. Yeah. And he took off when they traded for him. So, you know, that's a player development success when they fix a guy, right? Well, so they and, get and some the credit thing, for that. And I think the other thing is, like, I didn't realize how good he was last year. Like, he was a yeah, 5.9 B war, which, if you go by, is like a 70, like a number one, number two starter, which is what he is, I guess. Well, but, that's, he, but to me, you have to do that for more than one season. Before, yeah, before exactly. But, but still, even in his other years, he was 2.5 in 2015, 2.9 in 2018. Like, he's already put up 13.6 career war. Mm-hmm. So, and he's only 26 years old. So, he's just someone who I think his stock, he has chance to get even better um hope as soon if hopefully he comes back healthy but yeah he was pretty uh, he's uh what's it called he's pretty like it was a pretty easy to have him near the top of the list and it's yep. just he has a chance i think to move to number three pretty quickly with one more good year but right. the top two is a, there's a little more separation All I would right, say. so let's do the top three so number three is clay buckles um clay, clay Drow. Drow. he was really good for the red sox for a few years um i think you know, especially considering when he came from someone who was arrested in college, he wasn't really as highly thought of as some of the other guys on the list uh, as a prospect. I think he was a first round pick still, right? He was a supplemental first round pick. And the, the I don't know if it was Alex or who, who wrote, probably Alex Spear, uh, who wrote about his getting drafted, but the team was kind of, you know, they, they there was like one other team that they knew was really high on him. And it was kind of like a stare down to see who would take him first and who could wait the longest before they took him yeah because uh, some teams definitely took him off their board entirely so that's right. why they were able to get him where they did yeah so um but he obviously he he came up came in with some maturity issues but the red Sox developed him and he turned into a solid you know number three number two starter and you look back he had 2010 he had put up 5.6 war was all-star finished sixth on the cy young 2013 with boston he was also an all-star finished with he had a 4.3 war he also had some really bad years in there so that's and you know his overall war is it's you know it's like 16.9 but with boston it was 15.1 which is I mean, that's pretty good. And um, I think you could make a case that Erod, frankly, could be even be above him. But I think yeah. for now, Buckholz is going to stick there. I would, um, I would agree with putting Buckholz higher for now. Um, but then I think th- th- this top three was pretty easy. Like number two is yeah. number two and number one should be pretty obvious. Yeah. Um, number two is uh, Jonathan Papelbon, uh, everyone's favorite closer, or maybe not, but um, one one's favorite closer. And he's just one – you forget how good he was yeah. for that stretch. Yep. For like 06 to 09. I mean, as a closer to put up a five war season, is just insane. Yeah. Yeah. And he obviously, you know, in seven years only, he ended up only putting up like a 16 war, but as a reliever, that's really good. You know, he only really had one bad year with the Red Sox. Um, he was, uh, was it 2010 mm-hmm. was not good, but he came back in 2011 and was solid. And yeah, he's just, you know, he was just a solid shutdown closer for a stretch. One of the top, I would say, what five closers in all of baseball during that time. Yeah, and I mean, you and, can, I mean, his being what he was was crucial to the 07 championship. Exactly, and I mean, if you look back, and when we're talking about a development story, I think James Dunn t- touched on it um, in his 2003 write up. He was a fourth round pick out of Mississippi State, right. who developed as a starting pitcher and made some starts during his rookie year with Boston, but then they moved into the bullpen, identified you know that he could do there. And Shout got out his to, splitter. Yeah, sorry. Kurt Schilling for adding yeah. his splitter and then turned into one of the best closers. So, yeah. Uh, yep, no, go um, ahead. Number one. Oh, yeah. And then number one, I think, was pretty obvious to people. Um, and, and number one is John Lester. Um, Lester was actually drafted pre John Henry, but he did most of his development with the John Henry regime, which is why I'm putting him on the list. And this was kind of a no brainer. I mean, no Lester. Lester was one of has been one of the, you know with the Red Sox was one of the their I think he's in his nine years one of the better starters they've had twenty nine put up almost a thirty WAR he had a stretch where he was six WAR consistently six five six WAR so you know number one number two starter type uh, he was all star Cy Young contender you know he was an elite starting pitcher I would I think we can safely say 
Mm-hmm. And for a homegrown guy with, you know, obviously he had the cancer scare coming through the system. Right. right. You know, he, he did a lot and with the Red Sox and, you know, that's just a heck of a development for a second rounder out of, uh, where was he? Seattle high school. Still you pitching. Know. Yeah, I mean that's good the thing. scouting. Yeah, everything about it works. So that's he was the clear number one for uh, me. Yep, I think I I really don't have any quibbles with that list. Uh, to be honest, I think you pretty much nailed it. Um, why no Michael Kopech? So Kopech, I was close to near the bottom of the list, but he he his stock didn't really change with the Red Sox. Like he came in highly regarded as a first round pick. And he, by the time they traded him, you know, he was a top 100 prospect, probably, you know, I think he was what top 50 probably when they traded him, um, maybe a little higher, but look. I just, I, I don't think the development was as crucial to him as it was for someone like Beeks to extract value for him. If that makes sense. Yeah. It wasn't coaching Beeks up into becoming worth what he was worth. It was just, he was, he was there already. Um, let's see, at the time they traded him, they traded him during the 2016, 2017 off season. So he was, yeah, he was 32, 16, 36. Yeah. So he was a consensus top 50 guy at that but point. But yeah, so I just think that, you know, his development wasn't complete and, you know, it wasn't like he had, he never made his big leg GB with the Red Sox. I don't think he even got to Portland, did he? No, he, he topped out at, with Salem. So, you know, yeah, he, he pitched he 11 has, games in Salem. Exactly. So it wasn't like he did his, his development wasn't complete by the time they traded him. And, um, that was kind of what pushed Beeks ahead of him for someone like him for me. Right. Right. And we still don't really know what he's going to be in the majors is the other thing. Um, no. you know, Beeks, we kind of know what he's going to be and certainly Kopech could be a lot more, but you know, the Kopech walks is way higher upside, down. but do you yeah. know, walks, maturity things, injury concerns. I mean, he hasn't pitched since 2018. Like, yeah. Yeah, uh, but what, I mean, we, the big takeaway here is pretty obvious, Ian. That they're yeah, the takeaway is they're not very good at drafting pitching. Um, well, not very, well, drafting or, or developing, drafting. Who, they're not good at developing pitching. Which, and they, which it's, it's chicken egg. Yeah. Right. Is it is it identifying the talent in the amateur ranks or is it not developing the pitching? We can't really say. I mean, they've they, the thing is. And we kind of we're not going to do it with this episode, but we talked about they've had a lot of high profile misses. Like they've devoted a lot of resources to getting starting pitching, mm-hmm. and especially their high draft picks in the few years that they've had high draft picks, say for when they took Benintendi, and it just has not paid off yet. And that's kind of like the problem. You know, you look back and the top three on this list were all drafted what two thousand six or earlier. Yeah, like five or earlier five or earlier masterson was 06 workman and barnes were what 2011 and, and 2010 the f- Start- number four they traded for yeah and um, and jalen beeks was the most recent signee and he was or drafting he was 2016 other than him there's no one from after 2011 darwin's was an international yeah, signee wow. so that's a good point just, of late it's just been really bad it's kind of my takeaway and i mean they have traded guys but those guys i mean sean anderson hasn't done anything yet logan allen hasn't done anything yet I'm, I'm not putting them on there yet, even though you could say, well, you put Jalen Beeks on there and they traded him. Sean Anderson was, I mean, which deal was he? Was he uh, Nunez? Nunez. Yeah. Uh, Logan Allen was the number three guy in a trade for a closer. But Logan Allen had only pitched in the GCL. They didn't develop. Or right. Roll. They didn't I mean, do any developing of him. That's like, a good he didn't point. didn't develop, really. Yep. I think, I think it just yep. shows that, I mean, developing pitchers is hard and the Red Sox have not been very good at it. And it's something that they, I think they, they've identified they have to improve. And we kind of talked about it again, going back to the state of the system series, that this was an issue. And, you know, they, there's some upside in the low minors that hopefully can display some of the guys on this list, because it's not good that we're talking about the development stories. And of them, only three of them are like true starting pitching, starting pitchers. You know, you have six real true relievers and then you have Beeks, who's like a hybrid. And I guess Masterson's a hybrid, too. Yeah, Masterson, but, yeah. He probably should have been relieving before he was. But he was a reliever. Yeah, yeah. but like Lester Buckholz, Erod are the only relief or starters they've developed in right. 13, 15, no, 18 years. That's not yeah. good. Yeah, yeah. So that's, I mean, it, they're right. I mean, they haven't been good at it. Uh, it's a fair question. Um, look forward to I'm sure Jake, Jake will send in what his, his list was. So, yeah. Um, yeah, to send your thoughts on that if you would like anybody out there, podcast at soxprospects.com. The other email 
that we wanted to get to this episode. Now, I'll just kind of do it quick. I don't want this to turn into lecture time with Chris, but Alex writes, Hey guys, could our resident lawyer go a little bit into the, oh, sorry, go a little bit into MLB's antitrust exemption. As a layman, I'm not 100% sure what it is, covers, and or allows the league to do. I've been hearing a lot about it ever since MLB decided to essentially lie to everybody about their interest and the internet to restart the 2020 season. I'm sure there's a typo there, but I'm not quite sure what he meant to say. Um, I know it's not necessarily the topic we like to discuss on the site, but what else is there to do right now? Thanks, Alex. Um, fair question. Like I said, we want to talk about what you guys want to hear about. So a little primer on the antitrust exemption. And by the way, I should say the resident lawyer on the podcast, I guess, because Mike, the editor in chief is also a lawyer. Um, so I don't want to look like I'm trying to usurp his, you know, resident lawyer at the site throne. We also have a few others on staff, so it's not just me. Um, Okay, first off, antitrust, what does that mean? Okay, antitrust is, to super-duper oversimplify, just basically the U.S. government keeping companies, corporations, industries from acting in an anti-competitive way. So in other words, you know, company A and company B talking to each other and saying, hey, I won't charge, you know, let's let's coordinate our prices so that we're not in like a bidding war. You know, rather than charging $5 for our widgets, we'll charge $8 as long as you don't also go below $8 and we'll all make more money. That's anti-competitive behavior. It's illegal. The government does not like that. Same thing with um, mergers that... Um, essentially create something of a monopoly, right? So whenever there's a big merger, you'll hear about uh, the antitrust um, division of the Department of Justice getting involved and and evaluating the merger and either opposing it or approving it because they, you know, you want to have a certain number of companies in an industry because if there's only one huge company, then they can charge whatever the heck they want. And that is, again, anti-competitive. Um, so you don't want one company to have too much of a market share. Okay, cool. That's antitrust. MLB has an antitrust exemption. Why, what, how? Um, basically, it dates back to a case called Federal Baseball Club v. National League. Uh, so it's, it's Federal Baseball Club of Baltimore, Inc. v. National League of Professional Baseball Clubs. It's a 1922 United States Supreme Court case. And this is kind of the first misconception a lot of people have about the antitrust exemption is that it was created by Congress. It was not. It was created essentially by the Supreme Court back in the 1920s. And this this decision has been absolutely just beaten to hell and panned by folks who study this kind of thing. It's not a good decision. It is not well-reasoned. It is something of a relic of its time, as Nathaniel Grow in particular has argued uh, in his book on the topic and on fan graphs, where he used to be their kind of resident legal writer. I really liked his stuff. But um, the Federal League was a league that tried to pop up to be what I guess was essentially a third major league um, in addition to the American and National Leagues because the difference mattered a lot more than they were actually two separate things. But the Federal League tried to sue... Major League Baseball, when it kind of failed to, you know, make enough headway in, in competing with uh, the National League and the American League. So they filed an, a federal antitrust lawsuit against the Major Leagues in January of 1915. That's how long it took. It took seven years before it got up to the Supreme Court. Sounds about right. And it's kind of funny because the original case, Ian, was heard by Kennesaw Mountain Landis, who was at that time actually a judge. Um, he would and, later, yeah, later became, well, no, I mean, he later became the commissioner of baseball at that time. He was just another judge. Yeah. But he's right now, um, not exactly looking back, not the most favorable character. Um, some of his cases have very problematic. Fair. I mean, fair point. I mean, he's, like I said, part of it is that he's, you know, a product of his time, but you know, a, a fair point. Um, and of course I just lost the tab I was looking at. Where did it go? Um, oh, I must have clicked on something. Okay, here we go. Uh, but at any rate, yeah, so Kennesaw Mountain Landis, uh, here's the original case. The case eventually goes up to the Supreme Court. Uh, only one of the clubs is still left at this point because seven of the eight teams just shut down uh, in exchange for concessions from MLB. But the Baltimore Terrapins were the remaining Federal League team. So they fought on, filed their own antitrust lawsuit against the two major leagues. 
fought all the way up to the Supreme Court, where it's kind of funny, the unanimous decision was written by Judge Al- Justice Oliver Wendell Holmes, who's kind of a legend uh, in jurisprudence, very highly thought of, but this opinion is a stinker. Basically ruled that professional baseball was not subject to the Sherman Antitrust Act because it is not interstate commerce, which you would say, how is professional baseball not interstate commerce? The teams are all in different states. But the reasoning was essentially, you know, look, a baseball game takes place in one spot. It is not, you know, creating widgets and sending them across state lines and trucks to be sold. It is a thing that happens in one place. It is not interstate commerce. Ergo, it does not fall within the scope of the Sherman Act, Sherman Antitrust Act. Um, it's been heavily criticized. Look, I mean, the fact of the matter is that the if the case had been decided a decade later, no question it's, any, it's interstate commerce. But the Supreme Court at that time had a very different interpretation of what is interstate commerce. Um, they, they had a very narrow conception of the concept in their jurisprudence, and that's what they applied here. Um, but like I said, the, the decision has been absolutely panned, but it does not end there. There are several further lawsuits that come up in which the Supreme Court essentially okays this antitrust exemption. The first comes in about 30 years later. It's Toulson v. New York Yankees, and it's a minor league pitcher challenging the famed reserved cl- reserve clause, which basically, you know, pre-free agency, it was a clause in player contracts that essentially said teams could do whatever they want with you. You were their property. You could never be a free agent. They're going to pay you what they want. They could trade you if they want. Um, in Toulson, this minor leaguer challenged the reserve clause and it is a very short opinion. It is two paragraphs, essentially. Or is it? No, this one's not the short one. The short one is... Uh, is this one the short one? Hold on. Uh, da, da, da. Anyway, I think we'll, we'll get to it. It's a 7-2 vote. I'm sorry, it's not unanimous. Yeah, it's a one-paragraph opinion. And the Toulson Court upholds the antitrust immunity. And it's based on two things. The first uh, is something that the Supreme Court does a lot. It says, look... We ruled on this 30 years ago. If we had gotten this wrong, and Congress knows we've gotten this wrong, they would have passed a law saying that, no, we had intended the Sherman Antitrust Act to apply to professional baseball. And, of course, Congress had not. Congress had not done anything. And actually, the year before, they had held extensive hearings about uh, baseball's antitrust status, uh, and they concluded without passing any legislation saying MLB was subject to the Sherman Act. So the Supreme Court says, look, that's proof that we were right the first time. Um, The second reasoning was that ruling, you know, we're basically reversing their prior decision in federal baseball would unfairly subject MLB to uh, retroactive liability, saying, look, they did stuff because we said it was okay. They acted, you know, assuming they had an antitrust exemption because we said it was okay. Um, it would not be fair to now subject MLB to retroactive liability for that. You know, Congress is who acts prospectively. We act retroactively. It's not entirely unreasonable, but it, it, you know, you could say that it's also perpetuating a mistake. The Supreme court does reverse itself. Um, you know, this is not a thing they don't do. You know, if you, the more you study the Supreme court, the more it just doesn't make sense over time. Let me put it that way. But, um, Anyway, that's Toulson. Ian, just to make sure I'm, everybody's staying with me, I'll use you as my guinea pig. Are you with me so far? Do you have questions? No. Um, I think you're, it's actually pretty easy to follow this far. Okay, cool. Um, the third case is one that folks may have heard, heard of. It's Flood v. Kuhn. It's um, St. Louis All-Star center fielder Kurt Flood, who is known as the man who fought against the reserve clause and as a result of his fight, created free agency in Major League Baseball um, against Bowie Kuhn, who was the commissioner of baseball at the time. People don't realize this. Kurt Flood loses this case, too. Um, the Supreme Court case is not what got rid of the reserve clause. This That was arbitration that happened later. This is 1972. Um, the Flood suit is another challenge to the reserve clause. And... Again, people thought that the Supreme Court might overturn the antitrust exception here, but they didn't. It was a five to three vote. 
Um, Judge pa- Justice Powell recused himself because he owned stock in Anheuser Busch, which was the then parent company of the Cardinals. Um, so only eight justices participated, and uh, the Supreme Court acknowledged that baseball's antitrust exemption was an exception, quote, an exception and an anomaly. Uh, because in the interim since Toulson in the 20 years or so, the Supreme Court had refused to extend the same immunity to the NFL and to the NBA. Um, they had said that those were interstate commerce. Uh, so that's why I say, you know, if... Which if, makes a lot of sense. Yeah, because it, it's, it's interstate commerce. It's clearly interstate commerce. If you study this at all, it is the very definition. Teams travel over state lines. These well, games are why, broadcasting. You hear, you hear a baseball related thing, like you heard about it with the minor leaguers that call, that Congress always brings up the, well, we always could reevaluate your antitrust exemption. Yeah. Yeah. And in fact, it's been rolled back by agreement. Um, we'll get to that. But, um, you know, the, the, even though they had said the NFL and NBA do not have the same immunity, they said that the antitrust exemption still held um they refused to extend it they they deferred to precedent it's a concept called stare decisis um and it's basically that you know the weight of prior decisions you should not overturn them unless you basically have a good reason and they just didn't have a good reason here they said um again you could argue they should have uh i would probably tend to agree with it i think it's garbage (laughs) that MLB has this antitrust exemption but Look, the Supreme Court can't say, okay, you know, this doesn't apply retroactively, but going forward, they don't have one. Because the Supreme Court, people may remember from Justice John Roberts' um, uh, confirmation hearings that uh, he said, you know, look, we're umpires. We call balls and strikes. Um, Their job is not to make the laws. Their job is to interpret them. And so this is what they do a lot is they punt to Congress. Look, if you want to change this, Congress needs to do it because we've ruled. Uh, So that needs to happen through Congress. So... Third legal challenge, again, the Supreme Court upholds it. Uh, baseball's antitrust exemption has not been challenged in court since. Um, in 1998, the Congress did pass the Curt Flood Act, in which Congress partially repealed MLB's antitrust immunity, only in the sense that it allowed current Major League players to file antitrust suits against the league, which was the result of a compromise between MLB and the Players Union following the 94 players' strike, um, in which they agreed to seek a limited repeal of the antitrust exemption. Can you imagine this Players Association, Ian, by the way, bargaining to get MLB to lobby Congress with them for a repeal of the antitrust exception? What a different time we live in now. Anyway, I digress. So that repealed part of it. That said, you know, now we get to, okay, well, that's great. What does all of this mean? And frankly, it depends on where you are. Um, You know, if you are in... One state, it means one thing. If you're in another state, it means another thing. Generally, what it allows Major League t- Baseball to do is do things like carve out protected, de- protected geographic territories for clubs, um, allow its clubs to have anti-competitive contracts. Um, you know, like the Rays can't just move. Um, you know, the, the Oakland A's can't just move. An owner can't just move their team. MLB can stop them from doing so. Um, they can set salaries for minor leaguers as a league. That's anti-competitive behavior. They can just set what all minor leaguers are going to make. Um, they can set what the major league, I mean, the minimum is, is one thing, but you know, teams can act anti-competitively. They can set salaries for scouts who aren't part of a union, um, make rules and that you can't hire people from another team unless you give them a promotion. That's anti-competitive conduct. Um, so all of that, uh, is anti-competitive conduct. That's what they could do. But the part of this that, you know, it depends where you are, you know, in some States they interpret it one way in some States they interpret it another way. Uh, I had an article about it somewhere and I think I closed it. But for example, if there's an antitrust lawsuit against MLB, it's, I believe it's New York that it usually gets filed in because they only apply the antitrust exemption to the reserve clause, which doesn't even exist anymore. They interpret the original federal baseball decision as applying only to the reserve clause um, because that's what came up in Toulson and in Flood v. Kuhn. Um, you know, other states apply it more broadly. Some states, uh, they apply it, or some districts, you know, federal districts or I guess state courts or federal districts you're talking about 
um, you know, certain appeals, certain uh, bleh, circuit appeal courts will apply it much more broadly, saying MLB basically has an antitrust exemption to everything. You know, things like uh, some states don't apply it, for example, to radio broadcasting uh, of games. They say it doesn't apply to that. Other states say it does. So it really depends on where you are uh, and what it applies to. But it, it, honestly, um, it doesn't apply quite as broadly as one might think without looking into it is my takeaway. Um, you still have free agency. You still have play, MLB players can make, you know, uh, can sue uh, for antitrust uh, under the Antitrust Act. Um, but like minor league players can't. Scouts can't. Uh, I'm sure, you know, you'd have issues if, uh, you know, uh, a, um, you know, or you would obviously have an issue if like a startup league tried to sue them, like say one of the indie leagues tried to sue MLB for any competitive, anti-competitive conduct. They couldn't, uh, because of the antitrust exemption. So that's kind of how it plays out. Uh, basically like, like Ian referred to Congress kind of uses, as a, uses it as a, uses it as a, uh, sort of a sort of Damocles hanging over MLB's head. If they kind of step out of line, it's like, well, you know, we could look at the antitrust exemption and that usually whips them into shape. So, um, you know, I think that's, when was the last time they ran that? Probably the 120 plan was the last time they came up, right, Ian? Came up in the 120 plan when yeah. certain like state or sorry, uh, like Bernie probably brought it up. Some representatives in the house. Yeah. I know we're talking like the save baseball yeah. discussion or whatever. Yeah. They, um, like I think Lori Trahan from, uh, yeah, the, the Lowell, Lowell I want to say she's the Lowell rep. She's the rep of uh, Lowell's district. Yeah. Yeah. They, uh, the, the she and of several other, uh, Congress, uh, peoples, um, brought it up as a kind Congre- of threat. Congress mem- members of Congress is generally yeah. the non gendered term. Okay. But yeah, that's what um, I was going for. I went with Congress people. Yeah. So like, hopefully, hopefully that didn't bore people. Um, but I don't know. Any any questions on that, Ian, or should we put that one to bed? No, I think that's good. Okay, so that's that's the antitrust law uh, exemption. If anybody has questions, questions about like it. that, why well, I'm thankful that we have lawyers on the stuff. <laughs> yeah, basically, um, that's why we're here. So, uh, thanks for the questions again. Podcast at socksprospects.com. We want to talk about what you want to hear about to so get us your questions. We want to uh, get lots of great questions for our next episode. Thanks to everybody who sent those in. Um, that's all we've got for now. That's all for this episode. Ian, any parting shots for our folks out there in radio uh, podcast wear a, land? Wear a mask, stay safe, and hopefully things get better health wise for everyone. Yep. Um, thanks to Podcast Joe 2.0 uh, for producing and editing the shows. Uh, thanks to all of you for your emails, for your support on patreon.com slash socks prospects. You can follow us on Twitter. The site's account is at socks prospects. You can follow Ian at Ian Cundall. That's I A N C U N D A L L. I'm at S P Chris Hatfield. Um, make sure you're following the news page. We got the draft retrospective series. They're up every day, Tuesday through Friday. In fact, after this, I've got to go edit part two of 2005. That's going to be up uh, by the time you hear this. We'll probably be on 2006 by the time you hear this. So check out the news page. It's good stuff. It's a great stroll down memory lane. I love it. Um, James doing a great job setting the bar pretty high for the rest of our staff once they take it over next week. So um, for Ian, I'm Chris. Thanks, everybody, for listening. We'll be back in your eardrums soon.